Hey, welcome to the Wildcast. I had the honor of interviewing Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, who is a great Torah thought leader of our generation. We discussed some of the root causes of much of today's anxiety and depression and what we can do about it in our own individual lives. What happens to our souls after we die? Do they stay connected to the people we love the most in life? Advances in science shedding light on certain Torah ideas and the relationship, special relationship that he enjoyed with his teacher and mentor, the late and great Lubavitch Rebbe. Take a listen. Hello, welcome to the Wilds Cast. I am honored to be joined by Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson, who's one of the great spiritual thought leaders of our generation. Uh, he has got the most popular videos and podcasts, one of the most sought out speakers in the Jewish world, and for very, very good reason. Rabbi Jacobson grew up at the feet of the late and great Lubavitch Rebbe, absorbing his teachings and his writings, and um, has been able to distill some of the great teachings of the Rebbe uh, and bring them down to earth, if you will, for our generation. Rabbi Jacobson, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Mark. It's a privilege and an honor. So I'm going to get right into, um, I'm a big fan. I've listened to some of your talks. Uh, and I encourage all of our listeners, um, one of the things that you mentioned um, in your talk is you referenced the famous quote from Mark Twain, uh, who I believe in the late 1800s asked the question, what is the secret to our immortality? Right? The Jewish people have somehow outlasted all of these great empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and they're, you know, they've been relegated, as you so eloquently put to the dustbins of, of history, and yet we're still here. And he leaves it open as a question, what is the secret to our immortality? How is it that against all odds, the Jew is still kicking, we're still around? So uh, I know he left it as a question. I'm wondering if you can give us your answer. Why are we yeah. still here? Yes, it's, 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 such a, it's such a wonderful question. And as you said, Mark Twain put it so, so eloquently. This was an article, I think, in Harper Magazine at the end of the 1800s. Little did Mark Twain know what the Jews would be through during the 20th century. Yeah. He talked about the First World War, which was an absolute catastrophe for the Jewish community in Eastern Europe. The Bolshevik Revolution, which was an even greater catastrophe. And then, of course the greatest black hole of human and Jewish history, the Holocaust. So the question of Mark Twain for our times is so much more poignant and so much more relevant. And it's a question that every Jew really needs to ask themselves because as we struggle with uncertainty, with questions of Jewish continuity, with anti-Semitism, and various crises on an individual and collective level, I think this question is not just a theoretical, interesting question for a magazine, but it's one that ought to trigger each of us in, in maybe the deepest place. You know, what is, what is our secret? And I think one way of approaching it, and I think a very, a very solid one, a very intellectually honest way of approaching it is, you know, to learn from the world of science. Whenever scientists want to determine what is the secret of endurance of any physical property in any particle of matter that exists, you always want to identify the constants. You always want to distinguish between that which is always there and that which is just there for a period of time because the things that are more temporary obviously are more circumstantial because they can't attribute, they can't explain the longevity of something because they weren't always there. So you always look for those features that have always been there, the constants, and you can say, ah, this may be the secret. I think in Jewish history, we have to do the same thing. We have to ask ourselves, are there any features that have accompanied the Jewish experience and the Jewish people literally from day one till this very day? We've been around for close to 4,000 years. That's a long time. And we haven't just been around in the same place. We have been through the most extreme circumstances, the best of times, and the worst of times, to quote Hemingway. Hmm. We have been through paradise and hell and everything in between. We have come close to being ex completely wiped out from the face of this earth. And we have moments, we have had moments of bliss and prosperity. We have been expelled 
from literally almost every country where we have lived during our long history. You could maybe count on one hand the countries that have not expelled the Jewish people. And that includes, of course, Australia Hmm. and New Zealand, but we're newcomers there. And the United States of America, even though even in America there was something that came close to it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, to what do we attribute this power, this longevity, not just the ability to survive, but also the ability to thrive? So some people might say, well, geography. We were always together in one location, united and strong. Sadly, most of our history have been exiled from our homeland in Israel. You might say a strong army. Sadly, for most of our history, we have been vulnerable and defenseless around the world. You might say language. Language kept us together. Most of our history, most Jews spoke languages outside of Hebrew. Even until today, half of the Jewish people don't don't know Hebrew. Maybe culture, maybe a strong Jewish culture. The fact is that Jewish culture varies from one country to another country, from one climate to another climate, from one milieu to another milieu. So you go through the various questions, the various features that make a nation strong and powerful. Institutions, political institutions, sovereignty, culture, military presence, and all of these fall apart when it comes to the Jewish experience because some of them have been there for hundreds of years or even for more, but not always. And then you ask, is there anything that has always been there with the Jewish people from the day we stood at Sinai 3,300 years ago until this very day when I'm in conversation with you? And in this case, the answer is not so complicated because there is one thing. There is one thing that's always been there with the Jewish people in all geographical locations, under all circumstances, under all situations, in all of the eras of history, and that is what we call Yiddishkeit, the Torah and the mitzvahs that Jews have studied and celebrated in their daily lives and bequeathed to their children and grandchildren with unwavering commitment, passion, and dedication have accompanied Jewish men, women, and children from east to west, from north to south in every single era. So somebody may say, well, I don't see how that is an explanation. But scientifically, if I want to be honest with myself, we have to say that the power of Jewish eternity lay in those two factors, the Torah and the mitzvahs that the Jewish people have lived by and lived with, literally on a daily basis, filled their homes and their community with, that is the ingredient for eternity. And thank you, that was beautiful. And, and, and you believe it's Torah and mitzvah, you say scientifically, scientifically because that's the only factor we can point to when i say scientifically i mean i'm using i'm trying to use the scientific method Mm -hmm. whenever you want to ascertain what is the most plausible explanation Mm -hmm. to explain the long endurance of something whether it's an animal an insect a rodent a bacteria a fungus whatever force in nature positive or constructive or destructive and you want to give the most plausible explanation from a scientific perspective what contributes to it? I can't look for something that's been around for a few years and then it's been gone. Right. But if I could find one or two or three factors that have been there continuously, I say, oh, that's where the secret lay. And in our case, there's only one such feature that's always, always been there. And the truth is, if you go back to the Bible, if you go back to the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, it says it. <laughs> But what I wanted to do here is show a rational person who's really thinking about Jewish history how to come to this conclusion. But if you look in the Torah, Moses tells this to the Jewish people, not twice, not three times, but dozens of times. He says, you're going to go through a long and arduous history, but va'atem hadveikim b'ashem alekechem chayim kolchem hayom. Your dveikut, your, your dedication, your commitment, your internalization of the values, the celebration, the lifestyle, of the Torah and the mitzvahs, which we call the Jewish way of life, is what is going to guarantee your eternity forever and ever. Despite all odds, you know, you ask a question, where is the Egyptian empire? Where is the Babylonian empire? The Greek empire? 
the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire. Yeah. You have to understand, we all lived under them. They didn't only terrorize us, they reduced the Jewish people like Hitler close to ashes. If you were a fly on the wall watching the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70 of the Common Era, if you were a fly on the wall watching the destruction of the First Temple in 586 before the Common Era, if you were a fly on the wall watching the Spanish expul expulsion of Spain in 1492, or the Holocaust in 1939, 1940, 1941, a rational person would say, you know, these few million people, they tried hard, <laughs> they made a mark, but it's all gone. And yet the unthinkable, the inexplicable has happened. And a person like Mark Twain, a deep and intelligent person, wanted to know there's something, there's something strange here. Wow. Wow. You know, there's, uh, I, I love sharing the story that when I was in, Italy the last time, a couple of years ago, uh, I went to the Arch of Titus, which, as you know, yeah. is celebrating the Roman conquest of the Jewish temple. And it's got engraved into the arch, uh, the Roman legionnaires carrying the menorah and the other vessels from the temple. And, you know, people come there to marvel at it, at its beauty. And for a Jew, it's kind of like celebrating the end of Jewish history. And it was a little depressing to me, to be honest, but I don't know if this was there when you maybe were there the last time, but I looked to the right and I saw spray painted onto the wall, onto the wall, Am Yisrael Chai. The Jewish people are alive, which is, you know, some Israeli tourist with a lot of chutzpah. I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, conform, um, yeah, that's the encouraging yeah, graffiti. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, right, I'm not condoning graffiti. In you know. Rome. In a beautiful city yeah, well. Rome. But like, you know, it was interesting. It's like, you know, some tourist is like, they're still celebrating. There's no Roman Empire anymore. But the Jewish exactly. people are, you know, I'm Yisrael Chai. So I think that's incredible. And I, and I, to this day, you know, I've been involved in outreach for now for over 20 years. I find that to be what the way you just articulated that, Rabbi, about all of these great empires that have come and gone. I think that's one of the great I don't want to say a proof, but some kind of evidence for something beyond us, you know, but, and, and you're saying the answer to Mark Twain's question is, is the Torah, it's mitzvot. What would you suggest we do, given the fact that most of our Jewish brothers and sisters do not necessarily see Torah and mitzvot as the centerpiece of Jewish life or as the guarantor for Jewish eternity? So what what would you do? We pivot to something else, <laughs> you know, or or how would we how do we go about yeah. making Torah more of a centerpiece for more of our Jewish brothers and sisters, you know, outside the Orthodox world, outside those who go to the you know right. through in the day school system and so on and right. so forth. Right. I just want to tell you a few years ago I went to visit Berlin. They were putting up a new mikveh there, and I was asked to come speak. So after we were going to my hotel to go to sleep, it was late at night. So one of the, the Chabad rabbi of Berlin, his name is Rabbi Yudi Techtel. So he says, come, I want to show you something. And he takes me to the Brandenburg Gate. You know, and I grew up, I grew up in the home of a journalist and I'm a little bit of a, somewhat of a history buff. So I've watched Adolf Hitler's speeches at that location, but I was never there. This was my first time there. But I was, I'm looking at the Reichstag, you know, the German parliament, yeah. the building looking at the Brandenburg Gate and all the videos and documentaries and pictures of the parades, you know, Joseph Goebbels understood the brilliance of successful propaganda. And they had hundreds of thousands of millions marching through that gate to create German pride and the trust, the faith in Hitler and in the Third Reich and in their ability to conquer the world. Then Rabbi Tachtel showed me that for Hanukkah, the German president put up a menorah wow. right there. Wow. And he showed me the menorah. And I looked at it and I simply started to cry. Because imagine, again, you were a fly on the wall in 1937, 1938, watching the might, the prowess, the perfectionism, the meticulousness that the Germans knew how to employ so well to create that sense of dignity and national pride that you belong to something transcendent and larger than yourself and here there was this hum humble menorah it was <laughs> it was so moving it was so powerfully moving 
I think it's also important, you know, in response to your question, to realize that when you read the Hebrew Bible, when you read the Torah, which whatever your opinion is, is thousands of years old, all of this is literally predicted, mm. which is an incredible, incredible idea. Because if I was writing a book in the name of God, the last thing I would want to do is have reality contradict my facts. You know, the promise some nomad... Uh, Bedouin called Abraham, <laughs> that all the nations of the world are one day going to see him as a source of blessing, that he will inspire humanity. <laughs> right. To have a man, Moses, speak in the name of God and say, you will be exiled to every corner of the world, but you will never perish. You will never perish. You will return to your homeland, but just hold on to that covenant. Why are you writing these things that you know most likely it's not going to happen? Greater empires have vanished. So we see from here, this is one of, I think, wow. also, again, mm -hmm. quite a rational and I think scientific method to say, if you were writing this thousands of years ago and trying to make it up, you write things that are more plausible to happen, not something that reality and history is yeah. going to literally smack yeah. you in the face and show that you're a liar. And I think the call of the hour is the Torah does not belong to Orthodox Jews. The Torah does not belong to conservative or reform or reconstructionist or right wing or left wing or Hasidic or not Hasidic or Jews. The Torah belongs to every single Jew. As the Torah says, as Moses says, the Torah is an inheritance to the entire community of Jacob. And just like in the laws of inheritance, when a father or mother pass away, God forbid, every single child has a piece of that inheritance, no matter who they are their level of knowledge, and their level of observance. As I once heard from my teacher, he said, if a father is a billionaire and he passes away and he may leave a child who's one years old, that one-year-old child is a billionaire. He may not know it. He may not appreciate it. It may take years until he makes use of the money, but the money is his. He said the Torah belongs to every single Jew, no exception. And we have to be able to transcend the labels and create opportunities that every single one of our sisters and brothers from all walks of life and all backgrounds and all persuasions and all demographics understands that you have here a gift, a blueprint that has proven the most successful manual for life. Thousands of years later, our families are strong. Our spirit is strong. Our scientific yearnings and curiosity is strong. Our business acumen is strong. Our sense and obligation towards philanthropy and charity and healing the world and social justice is as powerful as ever. Give yourself this gift of Torah. And I think the labels that we constantly use to define the Jewish people, you know, labels are good for suits. They're not good for people. They're not good for souls. What labels do is they stifle everybody's growth. I say to myself, okay, I'm an Orthodox Jew, so I become smug. I'm a Reformed Jew. This is who I am. I'm a conservative Jew. I think we have to transcend the labels and call ourselves, each of ourselves, I'm the possible Jew. In other words, I want to know what is more possible. I love that. Me. love that line. It's beautiful. I, I've been a big, uh, you know, I grew up in a certain kind of part of the Jewish community, I guess the modern Orthodox. And as I get older, I'm beginning to see and agree really the way you just articulated that, Rabbi. Just the labels are keeping us from, from being who we could be. And also, I think, from being more united. For sure. And that's just, it's, a, it's a much more superficial way of, of defining people. You know, once you get to know people, and you have been in the world of outreach and communication and mentorship, once you get to know people, we all cry, and we all laugh, and we all suffer, and we all struggle, and we all have pain, and we all have moments of deep ecstasy. And if we could connect on that genuine, vulnerable human level, we will see that the differences between us, even though there are differences, and there are supposed to be differences, every person is unique, but the differences are superficial. Once you get to the deeper space of the soul, there's a universal language, and the Torah tries to articulate for us that, that vocabulary, that language. And let's stay on that for a minute. Um, you know, we all experience pain. We all experience some level of anxiety. Um, but I think... You would agree with me, Rabbi, that anxiety and depression seem to be more rampant today in our society, um, especially amongst the younger generation. And this is a very important yes. question. MGE is geared for 20s and 30s. I saw this a lot during COVID. Obviously, COVID exacerbated a lot of these issues. 
And there are, of course, many contributing factors. If you had to pinpoint what is going on in the world today that's different than, let's say, our parents' or grandparents' generation, that seems to be at some, you know, at least a, a truly contributing factor to anxiety, depression, and, um, and how is a rabbi? would you advise us going about combating this? Wow. A very potent and relevant question. I want to say that this is one of the mysteries of our times. People ask this to me all the time. They say, I grew up in the home of Holocaust survivors who have been in Auschwitz and lost their entire families. I know my own parents grew up in Stalinist Russia. My father saw his grandfather taken away Friday night during Kiddush by the KGB, and he didn't know where his father was. He was sentenced to death, and then 25 years, commuted 25 years in the Gulag. Our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, have suffered in ways that are unimaginable. Today, we live in a time that despite the challenges that many people have and loss and grief, nonetheless, the blessings and the prosperity and the opportunities and the freedoms we have were unimaginable, <laughs> unfathomable to our great-great-grandparents. And you would think that teenagers today should be the most blissful in history, <laughs> right? We live in bigger homes. We all have food. Most of us have food. We have money. Either, there are many levels, but the basics are there. Most of us live in security and freedom, against, again, relatively speaking. And yet there are levels of stress and anxiety that are unfathomable. And everyone is trying to understand what happened. I don't know that there is one answer for this. You know, there's a lot to discuss. People have theories after theories after theories, from technology to the breakdown of so many values, etc. And I'm sure each of them contribute. There's no question. You know, a culture of loneliness, a culture of social media, a culture of fakeness, uh, families disintegrating, and so forth. I think none of these can really explain the picture in full. And I'm going to give it my own spin. I may be right and I may be wrong. So, you know, I'm not saying this as a prophecy. I'm no prophet. And I'm not saying this as somebody who claims to really understand this. I'm just putting out something that, I, that resonates with me. It just resonates with me. And I think from a Jewish perspective, the world is evolving and history is evolving. The great spiritual masters speak about a time when the consciousness of oneness is going to pervade the universe. Judaism has a word for it. It's called geula, a redemptive consciousness. A time when we're going to be able to experience our full, infinite power, our oneness with each other, our oneness with God, our oneness with the planet, our oneness with the cosmos. But in order to be able to get into that space, we have to spit out the toxicity and the trauma that keeps us all trapped in our own psychological and emotional prisons. And I feel that what's happening now is God is almost giving us an opportunity for cleansing. Everything is coming out of the open. Yes, there were times when people lived in dysfunctional homes and with dysfunctional emotions. They didn't even acknowledge it. They weren't even aware of it. Emotions were not part of the equation. Today, it's just not working anymore. In marriages, in children's lives, in teenagers growing up, Everything is coming out. And there may also be, as one professor in Mount Sinai introduced the concept of epigenetics, which means, unlike we have thought in earlier times, our genes carry the traumas from the past. So it may be that now children and young in the youth are actually bringing out to the fore in epigenetics trauma that's not coming from them coming from their parents, grandparents, great-parents, maybe from 500 or 1,000 years or 50 years ago. So even though they're experiencing it, it's really an opportunity to redefine the past and to heal the past. So I think there is a great challenge now, but there's also a great blessing now. We are now challenged and empowered to create much deeper relationships with ourselves, with our families, with our friends, with our loved ones, with our God, we are now challenged to create marriages that are much more honest, much more authentic, much more profound. We need to be able to find a happiness and a sense of self that is much deeper and much more real because the superficial cover-ups 
simply are not working anymore. And, and first of all, this is fascinating. Epigenetics are genes carrying traumas from the past. Any um, any Jewish sources in Kabbalah or the like? Oh, <laughs> the, the, the uniqueness is that today this is considered science. It's, it's, it's considered biology. It's considered the science of, genetis, of, ge of genetics. But in Kabbalah, in Jewish mystical works, we're talking about Kabbalah, Machshava, Hasidic, Hasidus, which are works of Jewish spirituality. This reality has been articulated literally for hundreds, and I think for thousands of years. Namely, that the energy of our ancestors and their souls lives on in us. So you could have thought it's just some spiritual transcendent idea of faith, but today we know. And it actually lives in our body. You know, as Bessel van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score. Mm -hmm. From a Jewish perspective, that resonates so deeply because the mystics have taught it. They have taught it literally in so many sources Kabbalistically. And the, 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 there's even an expression in the Talmud. The Talmud has an expression, a tractate, hurry. The Talmud says, individual Jews die. Tzibur loy meis. The collective body of the Jewish people never dies, which means... An individual passes away, but don't think that the collective body of the Jewish people dies. It continues. So the individual person's life may have ended, but their life as part of a larger collective whole continues through their children and their students and their disciples. And today we know biologically how, how, how profound that is. So that means that I'm carrying within myself so much of the experiences, not just the color of the eyes or my metabolism or some biological facts about my life that genes are responsible for. No. In addition to all of that, I'm carrying the life stories mm -hmm. of my parents and grandparents and great-great-grandparents for thousands of years, which also means that I'm carrying their resilience and their faith and their wisdom and their sacrifice and their commitment and their dedication. So the same Jewish people that left Egypt and stood at Sinai and experienced the Purim story in Persia and the Hanukkah story in Judea, those very, very Jewish people are standing here today in 2022 living our contemporary lives. Wow. I mean, that is a fascinating thought. I think we should ponder for a minute because we often look at our own neshamot as our, our souls as being completely unique and individual to us. But what you're suggesting here, Rabbi, based on a, a, a long time Kabbalistic tradition, is that our souls are a composite of both. First, something unique, all created in Hashem, Selim Elohim, in God's image, as the Torah says. But but that image is somehow, you know, impacted, influenced, has absorbed the good and the bad of our specifically family members, or just part of the klal in general, part of the, the Jewish people as a whole. Yes, it's, it's a fascinating idea, and I think, you know, the language of mm -hmm. DNA that mm -hmm. we just discovered in the 1950s gives us, gives us eloquent, eloquent language with which to express this. You know, on one hand, <laughs> as somebody once said, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, you have to believe that all the living organisms in our planet were all using the same dictionary. <laughs> Somehow, they all knew to use the same dictionary, which we call DNA today. I share 50% of my DNA with a banana, and I share 98 or 99% of my DNA with a chimpanzee. So what makes me human? What makes me human is 99% of me is a chimpanzee, and I don't mean to offend any human being or myself. But what makes me human is that little, little, unique, tiny, tiny change in sequence of DNA, which is the imprint of God that makes you human, which we call Tzalem Alekim, the image of God. And what makes me different than you, and what makes me different even than my own brother or my own sister, <laughs> it's that tiny little unique, unique change in my DNA sequence, which is God's imprint for me. The Talmud says beautifully in Tractate Sanhedrin 38, every human being is obliged to say, for me, the universe was created. At the surface, it seems like somebody is suffering from narcissistic mm -hmm. personality disorder. You know, the world was created for me, and my wife is going to tell me the world was created for her. Right? It's a great marriage. What the Talmud means to say is, I have to realize that there's something at stake in my existence 
which the entire world needs. The day I was born is the day that God declared the world is an incomplete place without you. And it's your, and it's your unique individuated contribution, the light that you and I and he and she have to bring to the world that nobody else in the past, present, or future can bring into the world. Each of us constitutes an indispensable note in the divine cosmic symphony. So both factors are absolutely true. On one hand, there is your unique light that is yours and yours alone. And you have to say the world was created for this light. I can't underestimate myself. I can't afford to see myself as a schmata, as a nobody, as an inconsequential random mutation, as just some infinitesimal piece of particle of dust on the surface of infinity that amounts to nothing. All of Judaism is a protest against that resignation and delegitimacy of the infinity and the greatness of every single person, every single spirit, and every single human soul. Together with that, and as part of my journey, is the fact that I am a direct continuum of the past. Of course, first and foremost, my genetic mm -hmm. tradition, if you wish, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. But it works in much deeper ways because all of us are connected. As the Talmud says, if we come from Adam and Eve, it means that genetically we're connected. Ultimately, the Talmud says that the reason the Torah makes sure to say that all human beings came from Adam and Eve is that nobody throughout history should ever tell anybody, I am greater than you. Like we used to say in school, you know, my tati is bigger and stronger than your tati. Ultimately, we have one tati and we have one mommy, Adam and Eve. And this was so important for Judaism to know that we are all interconnected. We are all integrated biologically and also Nobody. spiritually. We're Nobody. connected vertically Nobody. and we're connected horizontally. So those connections happen in ways that are visible and that are mysterious, ways that are very concrete and we see it in our psychological makeup and our physical makeup and ways that are very deeply spiritual and transcendent. But you know, we come to synagogue for Yisker. It's a tradition that's very sacred among the Jewish people a few times a year on the holidays where people come and they remember the souls of those who are deceased. You may remember your father, your mother, your grandparents, siblings, uncles, aunts, great-grandparents, sometimes children or close friends who have passed away. And it's a very real relationship. We speak about the fact that God remembers these souls. We remember these souls. We pray for these souls. We love these souls. We connect to them. We even say, I want to contribute to give to charity in tribute of these souls, that means we consider our connection with past generations, not just nostalgia, not just a nice or emotional memory, but something very, very real that continues to impact us just like we impact them. And Rabbi Duke, thank you so much. Do you believe that after 120, we should all be blessed to live to 120, that our souls are then reunited and reconnected with the souls of the people with whom we are close in this world? Oh yeah, in, in, in Jewish, in the works of Jewish mysticism, this is a very powerful idea that the connection always remains. Even when we're living in this world and they have passed on, they think about us, they love us, they pray for us, they're aware of us, and they intervene on our behalf. And we can actually, just like when I, I could show love to somebody in the physical world, I can hug you, I can kiss you, I can give you a gift, whatever the languages of love, the languages of love continue also with the souls of our loved ones who are not here. It's just a different language. I can't give you a physical gift. I can't physically hug you or kiss you. But the languages of love change, but the love doesn't change. And and is and is, is there some sort of, are there any sources that indicate that after we're all gone. I mean, let's say, let's say a whole family has passed away, you know, please God, after 120 natural causes, whatever, that those souls are somehow reunited or remain, well, I shouldn't say reunited, you just said they never, they never disconnect, they always remain connected. But that on the, just on the soul level, because there's no body at this point, there is that connection that remains. Yes, absolutely. The connections of families remain. And the true thing is, the Malbim, one of the great biblical commentators, points out that when Sarah dies in the Torah, it's the first story of a funeral. You know, many people died before Abraham and Sarah, but there's no story of a funeral. The first story of a funeral and a burial is the story of Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham goes through intense negotiations 
with Ephron, who was from a Hittite, Hittite tribe in, in, in Canaan, in the land of Canaan, to buy this burial plot called Ma'arat HaMachpelah, which is still situated in Hebron. We know where it is. People go pray there. Why? He wants Sarah to be buried there, and he wants himself to be buried there. His child Isaac and his wife Rebecca will be buried there. Jacob will be buried there. Leah will be buried there. According to tradition, Adam and Eve are buried there. What's the significance of this? They're dead. They're gone. Fodder for the worms. Okay, you don't want to cremate them. You want to bury them. Fine. And the truth is the first Jew does this in order to establish a very profound Jewish principle. And that is the relationship between husband and wife and between families are not just physical, biological relationships. They're much deeper. Let's put it differently. The reason why this person is my father and this person is my mother, this person is my brother, this person is my, my sister, is not just a genetic accident. <laughs> it's because there is a soul connection. It's because there is an Ashama connection. In other words, the connection didn't begin after birth. The connection began way before birth. The Baal Atanya, one of the great uh, luminaries in Jewish spirituality, Rabbi Shnei Zaman of Liadi, writes, why are people happy at a wedding? <laughs> why? You could say Tati and Mommy, father and mother are happy. You know, they don't have to be. <laughs> they send you out of the house. That was just a joke. But why? What's the excitement of a wedding? And he says something beautiful. He says that a husband and a wife, their souls have been best friends in heaven before their birth. And a chuppah, marriage, is not a union. It's a reunion. For 20, 30, 40 years, these souls have been separated. It's like you said goodbye to your best friend and you haven't seen her. And then you date, especially in Manhattan, you date lots and lots of people. And they're all good people, but you know, it's not that. It's not that one. It's not that one. And then you find <coughs> that one. <laughs> That's my best friend from heaven. And you reunite. So that, that connection is a very, very real and authentic spiritual connection. And it's important for us to understand how Judaism views death. You know, people say, is there life after death? And really, from a Jewish perspective, it's the other way around. Something that's really alive doesn't die. <laughs> if it's life, it's life. Life doesn't die. The idea of death in Judaism is much, much more nuanced and ambiguous. And I think a better term to make it relatable is unplugged. What do I mean by that? Our soul is forever alive. When we're physically alive, imagine you plug in a refrigerator. What happens? The electricity is channeled through the refrigerator. When you unplug the refrigerator, electricity doesn't die. The electrons don't perish. They just revert back to their natural space and they're not channeled through the refrigerator because the refrigerator was unplugged or the computer was unplugged or the air conditioner was unplugged or the vacuum cleaner was unplugged. Death never affects the soul, the life of a person. It's unplugged. When we're alive, our bodies channel the life of the soul through the physical body. The consciousness of the soul flows through the visceral experiences of the body. Death is not an interruption of life. Death is unplugged. The body now, sadly and unfortunately, is not channeling the life, but the life is not affected mm -hmm. in the slightest. So we take very seriously the fact that a person's life is eternal. Yes, we mourn when someone dies. We grieve. It's very painful and devastating, we so because we want the physical contact. I want to be able to see you. I want to be able to touch you. I want to be able to hear you. I want the visceral experience, and that's the grief of death. But we never doubt that the person's presence, the person's life continues, and in many ways becomes even more intense because it's not limited any longer by the tools of the body. The Talmud, for example, says the soul has vision. But what does the soul see? The soul's vision extends from one end of the world to the other end of the world. When the soul is embodied, now I have to use my eyes as a tool for the soul's vision. And those eyes limit my capacity. Mm. The same is true with my brains, with my ears. So the body actually channels and limits and contains the power of the soul so that it's channeled through the physical and limited tools of the body, which are still incredible and amazing. But before birth and after death, the soul sees much more. The soul hears much clearer. The soul perceives and understands infinitely deeper, not constrained and mitigated and diluted 
by the physical containers of the physical. Power. So it's, it's, first of all, this analogy with electricity, I just think is so poignant. The idea that there's electricity running through our, our walls, right? I'm looking at an outlet right now. So I haven't plugged, there's nothing plugged into the outlet, okay? So, but the, the electricity is in there, it's ready to be channeled. So you're sa saying, I'm just clarifying this for everyone listening, because I think this is such a simple yet deep idea of Torah, of Judaism, that that the, that the soul, it's not like it goes away. The, the, this, this electric current never is removed. It's always extends. The question is, how is it being channeled? So in this world, we're channeling it through physicality. And remember that for thousands of years, we were unaware of electricity. <laughs> That's great. That's Remember great. that. Not because it didn't exist, but because we didn't right. have right. the tools to identify its existence. And when I, not, when I don't have the tools to identify something, I say, oh, it doesn't exist. Remember, for thousands of years, we did not know that there's such a thing called a virus or fungus or bacteria. <laughs> we blame the Black Plague on the poisoned wells, you know, the Jews poisoned the wells, etc. <laughs> Today we know there's something called a virus. You know, somebody told me the other day, I don't believe what I don't see. Sorry, I don't see God. I don't believe God exists. And I said, listen, I want to tell you something. From a scientific perspective today, we know that if you see something, it probably doesn't really <laughs> exist. The only things that really exist and have a real impact on our lives are things yeah. we don't see. Because whatever you can see is basically reality that has been so condensed and filtered to the point that the retina in my eye can absorb it and my brain can interpret it yeah, into a certain yeah. reality. You know, we decide that colors exist, but we know really do colors exist at certain frequencies that our eyes can observe and our brain interprets. So whatever you don't see is usually much more powerful and much more real than what you can see. So for thousands of years, we didn't know electricity exists, but with each passing year, providence God has given us more and more tools scientifically to be able to use those tools and see so much more of reality. You know, quantum physics today is freaking out most scientists because you're opened up to a world of paradoxes that are not logical. <laughs> Take light, it's both a particle and a wave, it acts in paradoxical ways, subatomic particles, etc., moving clockwise, counterclockwise, simultaneously. What all of this teaches us that we need to sensitize ourselves to the fact that reality is infinitely deeper than we imagine. And the same is true with the soul. The soul is a living presence. The question only is, do I have the physical tool to be to able detect, to channel it? Yeah. And that's what- To detect it, you know, it, it, I always think about that sometimes when I'm not into pets so much, but I have a friend who's very into dogs and he's got these crazy whistles. You know, you and you and I cannot hear the frequency when he blows into the right. whistle. It's I thought amazing. the whistle was broken. I could hear zero. The dogs went nuts. Amazing. And they were able to somehow pick up, you know, and I was saying that during COVID also, like literally the world was brought to its knees by something you and I could not see, by something so subtle. And um, I, I just think that's like, right. uh, but I love the electricity and being plugged in. And the last thing you said also was that, Sometimes, depending on how that electricity is channeled, it could limit the electricity, meaning sometimes the way that spirituality is channeled, let's say through physicality, that holds us back, right? The Rambam and some of the other greats would talk about how the body, you know, even though we celebrate the body in a sense in Judaism, not as a thing in of itself, but as a channel for spirituality, but that could impede. And there could be something even greater, a greater channel for spirituality you know, awaiting us all after this world. That's incredible. On the other hand, it's important to emphasize mm -hmm. that in Jewish philosophy, there are two streams. Maimonides speaks about how the body limits the soul. There's also a whole other literature, primarily Kabbalistic literature, that says that the body, even though it limits it, but the body also has within it a certain awareness that is even deeper in some ways than the soul. And that's why Judaism believes so much in the concept of the resurrection. Mm -hmm which is that the ultimate reward is for the soul to come back into the body. So the body keeps the divine score. And today we know in therapy, for example, that the body has awareness of everything, even things that your subconscious brain has blocked out of your memory. And therefore, on a personality level, on an awareness level, this is not part of my life. My body is always in tune to truth. 
And that's one of the reasons why Judaism so much cherishes and holds the body to be so sacred. Wow. I'm just, yeah, I'm just putting no, that I into the... I appreciate that because, you know, that I think that is at the root of that debate um, as to what is the nature of the world to come. Uh, there's a debate between Maimonides and Nachmanides and... and Right, and Nachmanides, who's more of the Kabbalistically inclined thinker, is telling us that the ultimate, exactly. the ultimate place is where the body and soul are reunited. Right. In, 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 you know, yeah. return. Right. Fascinating debate. Maimonides, who followed more the philosophical uh, uh, patterns and the philosophical Weltanschauung perspective, focused more on the fact that the body is important and holy and sacred, but it's a channel, and ultimately, it's a channel that limits. Mm -hmm. It's like the electricity, the electricity being channeled through certain wires, and that creates and affects the nature of the electricity that you're going to be able to perceive. Nachmanides focused very much on the power of the body, where ultimately the greatest, greatest intimacy with truth and with God happens in and through the body. And it's really different stages in history and different layers of reality. At the end, you know, all the arguments are just describing different angles and different aspects, and there's a truth in each. I one. am. Um, th th this is this is fascinating. Um, can I ask you a question, Rabbi? I'm told that you were privileged to be what's called a choser, like from the word chazara, to go over for the late and great Lubavitch Rebbe. Um, can you tell us a little about that? There is this. Uh, I always wondered how um, the teachings of the Rebbe. And many times he taught on Shabbat when we can't record or write anything down. And you were charged to, what, just remember everything he said and then write it down after Shabbat is over? I'm, I'm fascinated by that, if you could speak to that a little. Sorry to get off all the philosophy and all the Kabbalah, but I'm just... Yeah, yeah. You're bringing up some very powerful and sweet and uh, intense memories. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory... Um, he he lived, he was obviously a refugee from the Soviet Union and then from Nazi-occupied France. He came to these shores in uh, June 1941. And 10 years later, after his father-in-law's passing, he assumed the leadership of the Hasidic movement known as Chabad Lubavitch. This was in 1950. And he led it all the way till his passing in 1994. That's 44 years later. And uh, in, the, in the tradition of his predecessors, Every Shabbat, almost every, many Shabbases and holidays, he would communicate hour-long talks on the entire spectrum of Jewish thought. These were very long and intense talks. They weren't uh, what you would call short rabbinical sermons where you get up for 15 minutes, you say a joke <laughs> in the beginning, <laughs> a joke in the end, a few stories so that nobody falls asleep, you take up your glasses a couple of times, you lift up your hands, drama purposes, and so forth. And still... People say, Rabbi, it was too long. <laughs> yeah. Those yeah. of us who uh, have experience with sermons. The Rebbe would talk for many, many hours. Now, those talks were interrupted with songs and lively Hasidic melodies or introspective melodies. But he could talk sometimes a Shabbos afternoon for two, three, four, five, six, seven hours. There were times that he went for 10 hours. And you're talking about talks that were very, very intense. It could be an hour dedicated to a deep analysis on a Talmudic mm -hmm. tractate. Talks dedicated to intricacies in Jewish law, analyzing Maimonides, analyzing Rashi, discussing Kabbalistic thoughts, Hasidic thoughts, Jewish philosophy, Jewish psychology, what you call Hashkafa, Jewish perspective. Talking sometimes about contemporary events. The Rebbe had his pulse on the, his his finger on the pulse of the Jewish people. He would often talk about education, about happiness, about mental health, about Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there were no tape recorders in the tradition of the Jewish people on Shabbat and holidays. We don't use recording devices. Nobody use a mic. Nobody have notes. So there was a team known as Chayzrim. These were oral scribes. It was a small team, five or six people, who from day one of the Rebbe's leadership in 1950 were charged with the great duty and privilege of trying to memorize all of these talks and then after Shabbat review them and transcribe them. And they have created literally, I would say, around two or 300 volumes 
of these talks over the 44 years, the 42 years from 1950 all the way till 1992. 1992, the Rebbe had a stroke. He couldn't speak anymore and he passed away two years later. The first man on the team, the leader of the team was a man named Rabbi Yoel Khan, who literally came by boat from Israel to America two weeks after the previous Rebbe passed away and the new Rebbe would take over. And he was a brilliant mind. He actually just died this past August at the age of 91. So he, he, he literally just died a few months ago. And he was, the, he was the head of the team. And he would bring in every few years new minds that he felt were fertile for this job and he would train them. So actually, my, oh, I had an older bro- I have an older brother. Many of you know Rabbi sure, Simon Jacobson, fan also. Who, right, who was on that team and he brought me in as a youngster. And uh, this was a very, very intense task. It was, we felt that it was historic and that the responsibility is profound because the Rebbe was a genius par excellence. And when he opened his mouth to speak, we all felt that it's history in the making. If you don't transcribe this, this will be lost to the Jewish people and lost to the world. The wisdom, the mosaic, the tapestry, the eloquence, the profundity, and the ability to see all streams of Torah as ultimately part of a cohesive, infinite oneness and giving illustrations from the world of science and physics and philosophy and botany and current events, because the Rebbe also had great mastery of the yeah. secular sciences. He was, uh, he was an engineer by training as well, right? Engineer, yeah. yes. He spent years at the University of Berlin in Berlin, and then when Hitler came to power, he fled Berlin and he moved to Paris. Until 1941, when the Nazis took France, 1940, they took France, he lived there, and then he escaped to the United States of America with his wife. So there was just such richness in these talks, and also always a focus on emotional relevance. So what there was this team, and we would stand there and try to memorize as much as we can, <laughs> and I have to say, it was, it was an experience until today, Saturday night, when Shabbat ends, I experience heart <laughs> palpitations. It's basically my, uh, my brain's memory of what Saturday night used to look like. My friends went to eat pizza or go bowling in the good tradition of Brooklyn Jews Saturday night. But I was usually up all night reviewing and transcribing these talks together with the team. And uh, wow. it was really, that, that's basically what a, a what nutshell a, what story. A great merit. I mean, uh... the great challenge was you had holidays, for example. Sabchat Torah or Rosh Hashanah, that would, the holiday would yeah. be Thursday, Friday, and go on Shabbat. And the Rebbe had a Fabrengen every day of the holiday. So he would, uh, Thursday night there was an event. But he was Friday, aware, I mean, he was, Shabbat, he was aware that there was this group uh, charged with yeah, remembering yeah. to the best of their abilities. It. Often, often after the holidays or after Shabbat, he would send out a note with some extra ideas, and he would say, please add this to your oh, transcripts. You oh, know, wow. I didn't imagine this thing. So he would add. Sometimes we would ask him questions. There would be a lot of correspondence. You know, this was unclear. That was unclear. Could you clarify this? And the Rebbe would sometimes write pages. And he wrote, and he read, would he, he would read ultimately what was written to sort of okay it after the fact? He would take a look at it, but mostly he did not edit it. In other words, he relied on the right. memory of the people, he did ask that they should always write on top that it was not reviewed oh, and not okay. edited by him. So people should realize that these manuscripts are prone to error, which they certainly are. Often, however, sometimes there's big there's manuscripts that we prepared and he edited them, and they're published in special series of the Rebbe's talks that were edited and reviewed by him, and he added many footnotes right. and he erased. You know, it, it's 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 uh, fascinating to listen to because uh, so my. I didn't have the zechut, the merit uh, to learn under Rabbi Salvechik directly. My first year in, in Yeshiva University was his last year teaching, but all my teachers were his students, and I'm obsessed with all of his writings. And he he didn't write as much as he lectured, but they fa- they thankfully and they still have thousands of hours of lectures that have still not been um, you know uh, put to paper. Uh, but there's still, you know, since the Rav died, also about 25 years ago or so, he um, they've come out with probably a dozen books already. Yeah. The Rav died one year before yeah. the Rebbe, in 1993, yeah. in the middle of the Passover yeah. holiday. Yeah. 
And the relationship, the relationship between the two was very, very special. They knew each other in Berlin. And um, Soloveitchik shared some amazing stories. And I remember when Rabbi Soloveitchik came to a public fabrengan oh. of the Rebbe, 1980. You were there? You were there? The Rebbe was... I saw the, you, I, I I was saw the YouTube of that. that was, that's, yeah, please, go ahead. So serving the 30th anniversary of his father-in-law's yard site, the 6th Lubavitcher Rebbe, which was basically 30 years of the anniversary of him becoming the Rebbe. So Rabbi Soloveitchik, who knew the Rebbe back in Berlin in the 1930s, the early 30s and the late 20s, and uh, they knew each other quite well, Rabbi Soloveitchik said. What happened was he decided to come and honor the Rebbe and Chabad by attending that Fabrengen. And I have to tell you, Rabbi, it was an incredible scene because uh, with, the Rebbe was respectful to everybody. He was a gentleman. But the display of respect that he uh, demonstrated to Rabbi Soloveitchik that evening was pretty incredible. He came in and he greeted him and they spoke for a few moments and then he wouldn't sit down until they got Rabbi Soloveitchik a comfortable chair. Rabbi Soloveitchik initially said he'll stay for 20 minutes. You know, he was already an older man. This is 1980. Uh, they were both, uh, the Rebbe was almost 80 and Rabbi Soloveitchik was 79 or 80 years old. And this was later at night. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, early in the morning. The Rebbe began 9.30. Rabbi Soloveitchik said he's going to stay 20 minutes. He ended up staying for more than two hours. And to watch these two people sitting right near each other, and to see Rabbi Soloveitchik so enthralled by the sikhot, by the talks of the Rebbe, uh, it was really a very, very moving experience. And I remember the Rebbe made them a seal. He concluded the study of four tractates of Talmud, Brachot, Nazir, Yevamot, and Chrysos. And he gave this long explanation uh, in the presence of Rabbi Soloveitchik, following which Rabbi Soloveitchik stood up to leave. And I remember how the Rebbe jumped up and waited until he left the shul, which took a while to get out, to get through the crowd. And only after Rabbi Soloveitchik left the shul did the Rebbe sit down. It was a very... Um, uh, moving sight to behold, even though I was a young child. Unbelievable. I, I I'm told that, uh, I know this from my teacher uh, and mentor, Rabbi J.J. Schachter, who I'm very, very close with, who helped me start MGE. His father, yeah. Rabbi J.J.'s father, Rabbi Herschel Schachter. Right, was he was the one who remember. escorted him in. Now, I don't know, I was going to ask you this, I don't know. I heard from him, Rabbi Herschel Schachter of Blessing yeah. Memory, Rabbi J.J.'s father told me, he was a rabbi in the Bronx, right, in Riverdale. And he was one of the chaplains who liberated one of the yeah, concentration camps. They just came out with a book called The Rabbi of Buchenwald. Rabbi, Rabbi Lau, the former chief rabbi of Israel, I believe, met Rabbi he, Schechter on the he, day um, of, he, days after I the heard Rabbi Lau say that Rabbi Schechter, Rabbi Herschel Schechter, saved his life, pulled him out of a, a crazy, crazy story. But but I heard from Rabbi Herschel Schechter that, that I don't know if the Rebbe said this to the Rav, Rav Salvechik, to the Lubavitcher Rebbe's uh, for both of them, um, but that the descendants of the Baal HaTanya, Rav Shner Zaman Liadi, and the Vilna Gon, because the Rav was a direct descendant also, are sort of like now embracing and meeting up. You know, because these were, for those listening, these were two great rabbinic giants um, who lived hundreds of years ago that, um, you know, were at odds. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, um, and, uh, and now they're great, 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 whatever are, you know, sort of connected. And, um, so I'll tell you how I heard it. First of all, Rabbi Herschel Shechter told me that the Rebbe turned to the Rav, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and he pointed to Rabbi Shechter and he said, which means you have extraordinary students, wonderful students. You know, it was like a compliment because Rebbe also knew Rabbi Shechter quite well from previous occasions. I heard from Rabbi Julie Berman, who for many years led the pres the, pres uh, the OU and the Claims Conference, and he shared this with me, that the day after the Fabrengen, the day after, he went to visit his Rebbe, the Rav, Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi Yosheba Soloveitchik. And either it was him or somebody else who remarked a little maybe wittedly, wittingly to the Rav and said, they say that last night, the Balatanya and the Vilna God made peace in paradise. <laughs> because the Lubavitch Rebbe, of course, was a grandson right. son and skiing of, of the founder of Chabad, the author of the Tanya and Shulchan Aruch Rebbe Shnei Zamr of Liadi. Rabbi Soloveitchik came from the glorious dynasty of Lithuanian Torah aristocracy, the Soloveitchiks, who traced their lineage back to Rabbi Chaim Vavalajan, the great student of the Vilna God. So last night, as Rabbi Soloveitchik showed up in 770 at the Havrengen of the Lubavitch Rebbe, he said, these two giants 
the Vilna Gon and the Balatanya made peace in heaven and paradise. And he told me, listen to this, Rabbi Soloveitchik sighed. And he went like this. He said, no, 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 no. They already made peace in Auschwitz. Oh, I never heard that. And of course, he was conveying a very, very profound truth that we often fail to forget, unfortunately. And that is that when Joseph Mengele made the selection, he didn't ask you, you're a chassid? You're a litvak? Let me see the hat you wear. You wear a strimal? <laughs> you wear a kippah Oh, you don't wear a kippah? That was not the question. The question was, are you Jewish? And if you're Jewish, you're good enough to go to the gas chambers. You're holy enough for Hitler and Mengele wanting to exterminate you. And Rabbi Soloveitchik's point was that one of the worst mistakes we Jews can make is surrender and fall prey to the prison of labels. In other words, if there's one lesson that Auschwitz had to teach us, among many lessons, among many lessons, Jews have to be strong, Jews have to be powerful. But one of the big lessons of Auschwitz is Jews have to be united. We don't have Amen. to agree. We don't have to agree Amen. on everything. God forbid, we want to be Jewish. But we have to be able to trust each other. We have to be able to be here for each other. We have to be able to be loyal to each other. I always compare it to a marriage. Husbands and wives do not have to agree about everything. And if they're Jewish, that would be a crime that they'd agree about everything. But we have to have each other's back a thousand percent. We have to be loyal to each other. We have to be dedicated to each other and we have to be able to be able to trust each other because if we don't have that then we ultimately create heaven forbid a breach in our own security and our own safety jews need to be united we must we are a small people and we are a vulnerable people and when we're connected we become like a fortress and when we allow inner discord and contention in other words we allow disagreements to lead us to strife and hatred and animosity and, and politics and infighting, it's, it's, it's literally dangerous. If you look through Jewish history, you'll see that every destruction of the Jewish people was introduced previously with internal discord and contention. It starts with Joseph and his brothers, and it continues throughout history. So this is something that I think Rabbi Soloveitchik was saying, we didn't need the Fabrengen last night to, to, to make peace. Wow. I just thought very, of a very, very, very cool. Rabbi, answer. thank you. This is, I cannot think of a more appropriate uh, point on which to, to conclude and to thank you for, for not only teaching us and spending this last hour plus with us, with me, with our listeners, but for, for spreading not only the light of Torah that you do in such a profound way, but really unity uh, amongst the Jewish people. And in doing so, you give great, great honor to your beloved Rebbe. The Lubavitch Rebbe, Zechot Sakhla Bracha. His memory should be a blessing, and Hashem should bless you. To... That's a beautiful compliment. That's from the better compliments. That's from the greatest compliments ever. <laughs> That's coming from Dvarm uh, Hayotzim and Alev. Really, I, I have the greatest respect, and I thank you for helping us. You know, we are at MGE dedicated to engaging our less affiliated Jewish brothers and sisters, and. I've taken most of my cues from from Chabad, from from the Rebbe, and um, and uh, I, I just I think the work you're doing and the incredible teaching and, and lecturing and podcasting and YouTubing is just so helpful. It's, it's helpful to me. It's helpful in my work. And and Hashem should bless you to be able to continue to just just go from strength to strength. Amen. And may you and the Manhattan Jewish Experience. <laughs> Also, oh, go from man. strength to strength. Oh, man. It would be... be able to saturate the world with love and Yiddishkeit and Judaism. And anytime you're in the city, it would be the greatest, greatest joy for us to be able to host you in person, as they say. You'll be my but um, I, I really, I thank you so much for your time. This is really extraordinary. And uh, just may go go from chayal chayal to from strength to strength. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. All of oh, us, man. thank you. And may you be blessed with all the blessings, with health, mm -hmm. happiness, and prosperity, and to continue to be able to be an ambassador of so much wisdom and love and light and hope to so many of our brothers and sisters in Manhattan Man, thank and you. beyond. Thank you so much.